reading from the uh, MacArthur Daily Bible, which will have it, um, which is going to allow us to get through the Bible in 365 days, and um, we're reading it word for word as how it's written here, because uh, we've never fully been through the Bible, and this has helped keeping us disciplined to get through it. Um, and um, it has a lot of footnotes and extra um, extra content that uh, we read on the site as well that uh, better inform us of, of what some of these verses mean in some of these chapters. And today is July 11th, and we are still in Second Chronicles of the Old Testament. And we know, I'm... yeah. Um, our verses today are Second Chronicles chapter 17, verse 1 through chapter 18, 34. Jehoshaphat, his son, then became king in his place and made his position over Israel firm. He placed troops in all the fortified cities of Judah and set garrisons in the land of Judah and the cities of Ephraim, which Asa, his father, had captured. The Lord was with Jehoshaphat because he followed an example of his father David's earlier days and did not seek the balls, but sought, some of, sought the God of his father, followed his commandments, and did not act as Israel did. So the Lord established the kingdom in his control. And all of Judah brought tribute to Jehoshaphat, and he had great riches and honor. He took great pride in the ways of the Lord, and again removed the high places and the Asherim from Judah. Then in the third year of his reign, he sent his officials, ben Hale and Obadiah, and Zechariah, and Nathaniel, and Micaiah, to teach the cities of Judah. And within the Levites, Shemiah, Nathaniah, Zebediah, Ashel, Shemarath, Jehanathah, Adoniah, Tobiah, Tabadoniah, and the Levites, and from within Elishma and Jerom, the priests, and they taught in Judah, having the book of the law of the Lord with them, and they went throughout the cities of Judah and taught among the people. And our first note is from verses 3 through 9. Jehoshaphat made three strategic moves spiritually speaking. One, he obeyed the Lord, as stated in verses six, uh, 3 through 6. Two, he removed false worship from the land in verse 6. And three, he sent out teachers who taught the people the law of the Lord in verse 7 through 9. Now we're back in verse 10. Now the dread of the Lord was on all the kingdoms of the lands which were around Judah, so that they did not make war against Jehoshaphat. Some of the Philistines brought gifts and silver tri uh, tribute to Jehoshaphat. The Arabians also brought him flocks of 7,700 rams and 77 male goats. So Jehoshaphat grew greater and greater, and he built fortresses and store cities in Judah. He had large supplies in the cities of Judah and warriors, valiant men in Jerusalem. Our next notes from verses 12 through 13. These verses indicate the massive wealth that developed under divine blessing as shown in chapter 18 verse 1 as well as formidable military power shown in verses 14 through 19. This was their muster according to their father's households of Judah, commanders of thousands. Adna was the commander and with him 300,000 valiant warriors. And next to him was Jonan, the commander and with him 280,000. And next to him Amaziah, the son of Zechariah who volunteered for the Lord, and with him 200,000 valiant warriors. And of Benjamin, Elida was a valiant warrior, and with him 200,000 armed with bow and shield. Next to him, Jehozabad, and with him 180,000 equipped for war. These are they who served the king, apart from those whom the king put in the fortified cities through all of Judah. Now Jehoshaphat had great riches and honor, and he allied himself by marriage with Ahab. Some years later, he went down to visit Ahab at Samaria, and Ahab slaughtered many sheep and oxen for him and the people who were with him and induced him to go up against Ramath Gilead. Ahab, king of Israel, said to Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, will you go with me against Ramath Gilead? And he said to him, I am as you are, and my people as your people, and we will be with you in the battle. Moreover, Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, Please inquire first for the word of the Lord. Then the king of Israel assembled the prophets, four hundred men, and said to them, Shall we go against Ramoth Gilead to the battle, or shall I refrain? And they said, Go up, for God will give it into the hand of the king. But Jehoshaphat said, Is there not yet a prophet of the Lord here that we may inquire of him? The king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, 
There is yet one man by whom we may inquire of the Lord, but I hate him, for he never prophesies good concerning me, but always evil. He is Micaiah, son of Imla, but Jehoshaphat said, Let not the king say so. Then the king of Israel called an officer and said, Bring quickly Micaiah, Imla's son. Now the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, were sitting each on his throne, arrayed in their robes, and they were sitting at the threshing floor of the entrance of the gate of Samaria. And all the prophets were prophesying before them. Zedekiah, the son of Shenna, made horns of iron for himself and said, Thus says the Lord, With these you shall gore the Arameans until they are consumed. All the prophets were prophesying, thus saying, Go up to Ramoth Gilead and succeed, for the Lord will give it into the hand of the king. Then the messenger who went to summon Micaiah spoke up, saying, Behold, the words of the prophets are uniformly unfavorable to the king. So please let your word be like one of them and speak favorably. But Micaiah said, As the Lord lives, what my God says that I will speak. When he came to the king, the king said to him, Micaiah, shall we go to Ramoth Gilead to battle, or shall I refrain? And he said, Go up and succeed, for they will be given into your hand. Then the king said to him, How many times must I adjure you to speak to me nothing but the truth in the name of the Lord? So he said, I saw all of Israel scattered on the mountains like sheep, which have no shepherd. And the Lord said, These have no master. Let each of them return to his house in peace. Then the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, Did I not tell you that he would not prophesy good concerning me, but evil? Micaiah said, Therefore hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne, and all the hosts of heaven standing on his right hand and on his left. The Lord said, Who will entice Ahab, king of Israel, to go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? And one said this, while another said, Then a spirit came forward and stood before the Lord and said, I will entice him. And the Lord said to him, How? And he said, I will go and be a deceiving spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. Then he said, You are to entice him and prevail also. Go and do so. Now therefore, behold, the Lord has put a deceiving spirit in the mouth of these your prophets, for the Lord has proclaimed disaster against you. Then Zedekiah, son of Chenna, came near and struck Micaiah on the cheek and said, How did the spirit of the Lord pass from me to speak to you? Micaiah said, Behold, you will see on the day when you enter an inner room and hide yourself. Then the king of Israel said, Take Micaiah and return unto Ammon, the governor of the city, and to Joas, the king's son, and say, Thus says the king, Put this man in prison and feed him sparingly with bread and water until he returns safely. Micaiah said, If you indeed return safely, the Lord has not spoken by me. And he said, Listen, all you people. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, went up against Ramoth Gilead. The king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, I will disguise myself and go into battle, but you put on your robes. So the king of Israel disguised himself and went into battle. Now the king of Aram had continued the captains of his chariot, saying, Do not fight with small or great, but with the king of Israel alone. So when the captains of the chariot saw Jehoshaphat, they said, It is the king of Israel. And they turned aside to fight him. But Jehoshaphat cried out, and the Lord helped him, and God diverted them from him. When the captains of the chariot saw that it was not the king of Israel, they turned back from pursuing him. A certain man drew his bow at random and struck the king of Israel in, in, a, in a joint of the armor. So he said to the driver of the chariot, Turn around and take me out of the fight, for I am severely wounded. The battle raged that day, and the king of Israel propped himself up in his chariot in front of the Arameans until evening. At sunset he died. And now we have Psalm 81, verses 11 through 16. But my people did not listen to my voice, and Israel did not obey me. So I gave them over to the stubbornness of their heart, to walk in their own devices. Oh, that my people would listen to me, that Israel would walk in my ways. I would quickly subdue their enemies and, my, and turn my hand against their adversaries. Those who hate the Lord would pretend obedience to him and their time of punishment would be forever. But I would feed you with the finest of wheat, and with honey from the rock I would satisfy you. Now our note for Psalms is from verse 16, honey from the rock. The phrase was first used by Moses in his song of praise in Deuteronomy 32, 13. Though honey is sometimes found in the clefts of the rock, the intent of the figure here is more likely to valuable food provided from unlikely places. And then we have Proverbs 20, 26 through 28. 
A wise king winnows the wicked and drives the threshing wheel over them. The spirit of man is the lamp of the Lord, searching all the innermost parts of his being. Now our note for Proverbs is uh, the lamp of the Lord. The spirit represents the conscience of man which searches every secret place. And then we finish with Proverbs in verse 28. Loyalty and truth preserve the king, and he upholds his throne by righteousness. Now we're finishing in Acts 16, 19, uh, 19 through 40. But when, he hear, but when her master saw their hope of prophets was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the authorities. And when they had brought them to the chief magistrates, they said, These men are throwing our city into confusion, being Jews, and are proclaiming custom, which it is not lawful for us to accept or observe, being Romans. The crowd rose up together against them, and the chief magistrates tore their robes off them and proceeded to order them to be beaten with rods. When they had struck them with many blows, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to guard them securely, and he, having received such a command, threw them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. But about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God, and the prisoners were listening to them, and suddenly there came a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison house were shaking, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's chains were unfastened. When the jailer awoke and saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried out with a loud voice, saying, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And he called for the lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. And after he brought them out, he said, Sirs, what, um, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. Now we have a couple notes. Our first is from verse 24. Isn't inner prison in the stocks? The most secure part of the prison, the jailer took further precautions by putting their feet in the stocks. This particular security measure was designed to produce painful cramping so the prisoner's legs were spread as far apart as possible. Our next note's from verse 27, prison doors opened and about to kill himself. Instead of waiting to face the humiliation and painful execution, a Roman soldier who let the prisoners escape paid for his negligence with his life. This is also referenced in Acts 12:19 and Acts 27:42. And our next note is from verse 31, believe in the Lord Jesus. One must believe he who is claimed to be, as referenced in John 20:31 and believe in what he did in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 4, as well as Romans 1, 16. You and your household, all of his family, servants, and guests who could comprehend the gospel and believe, heard the gospel and believed. This did not include infants. See verse 15. And now we're back in verse 32. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him together with all who are in his house. And he took them at the very hour of the night and washed their wounds. And immediately he was baptized, and he and all his household. And he brought them into his house and set food before them and rejoiced greatly, having believed in God with his whole household. Now when the day came, the chief magistrates sent their policemen, saying, Release those men. And the jailer reported these words to Paul, saying, The chief magistrates have sent to release you. Therefore come out now and go in peace. But Paul said to them, They have beaten us in public without trial, men who are Romans, and have thrown us into prison, and now they are sending us away secretly? No, indeed, but let them come themselves and bring us out. The policemen reported these words to the chief magistrates. They were afraid when they heard that they were Romans, and they came and appealed to them. And when they had brought them out, they kept begging them to leave the city. They went out of the prison and entered the house of Lydia, and when they saw the brethren, they encouraged them and departed. Now we have our day 11 note, which is, How did Roman law affect Paul in the preaching of the gospel? The city of Philippi, which was located 10 miles inland from Nepalis, was named for Philip II of Macedon, the father of Alexander the Great. It was a Roman colony as referenced in Acts 16.2. Philippi became a Roman colony in 31 BC, so it carried the right of freedom, which is, it was self-governing and independent in the provincial government the right of exemption from tax, and the right of holding land in full ownership. In Acts 16.21, Paul and those who with him are accused before the city magistrates as troublemakers who are, quote, are proclaiming custom not lawful for us Romans, end quote. It was technically true, 
that Roman citizens were not to engage in any foreign religion that had not been sanctioned by the state, but it was a false charge that they were creating chaos. Every Roman colony had two magistrates serving as judges. In this case, they did not uphold Roman justice. They did not investigate the charges, conduct a proper hearing, or give Paul or Silas a chance to defend themselves. And said the magistrates had beaten them with rods. This was an illegal punishment since they had not been convicted of any crime. The officers in verse 35, under the command of the magistrate, administered the beating with the rods tied together in a bundle. Paul received the same punishment on two other occasions. This is referenced in 2 Corinthians 11.25. Later, when Paul told them they were Romans in verse 37, it was a real problem. To inflict corporal punishment on a Roman citizen was a serious crime and made more so since Paul and Barnabas did not receive a trial. As a result, the magistrates faced the possibility of being removed from office and having Philippi's privileges as a uh, Roman colony revoked. And that is all of our notes for today. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll be back for July 12th. Thank you.